Right, where do you want me? Here? Okay. Yeah, the microphone's on. I mean, this is heavy. It might pull my trousers down, you know. So I'm going to make sure it doesn't fall down. Is my hair all right? Okay. Yep, yeah, I'm ready. That camera, yeah? Okay. Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm filming my question and answer video that I have posted about on my Instagram account at Sandra Blomart, and I'm so happy to have received all your questions and I'm gonna try and answer them, all of them, with all my knowledge and I'm looking forward to it. Now, as many of you know, yesterday was quite a big day for me. I graduated and I obtained two diplomas. Um, one is the Royal Ballet School's Vocational Dance Diploma, and the other one is the Dance Development Learning and Teaching Diploma from Trinity College. So I'm really excited to have had a graduation for that yesterday, and what a nice way to end the week with filming this video for you all. Right, let's get started. I'm just gonna unlock my phone. Um, so I can go to the first question. Okay, here we go. This is question number one. The question is, my son, who is 11 years old, gets frustrated when he sees most girls in class doing a full split and he is still far off the ground. Can flexibility be gained? How much time stretching daily do you recommend? Okay, so there's two questions there. The first question is, can flexibility be gained? Absolutely, especially if you have a young child. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before, under the age of 18, it's a lot easier to gain flexibility because you're still growing and your muscles are still quite pliable and you can improve flexibility a little bit more. But it's a myth that after 18, you can't get any more flexible, you really can. Like I said, you have stopped growing, it's just that little bit harder and you have to do it more frequently. But to answer that question, can flexibility be gained? Yes. So the second part of this question is, how much time stretching do you recommend daily? Now, and I think this varies on how flexible or inflexible you are. Now, I think if you're a little bit stiff, then you definitely want to stretch on a daily basis but it's quite difficult to answer how much time this will take because it depends if you are warmed up or not. So if you're stretching after a ballet class, then I would say you can stretch about 10 minutes and that's sufficient. You can stretch longer than that, at least 20 minutes. Now, if you are quite flexible, then you want to keep up that flexibility. And this is the thing with stretching is people think once you're flexible, that you're flexible, but you have to maintain your flexibility. So whether you are inflexible or already flexible, I, I recommend daily stretching is advised from my point of view to maintain that flexibility. So I think to answer this question it, with proper time timelines, I would say try to stretch for at least 10 minutes a day. Now you can stretch up to 20 minutes if you feel like you need to stretch that little bit more, if you are that little bit more inflexible than others in your classes. So 10 minutes to 20 minutes if you feel like you need to make a bigger improvement. Let's do the next question. Can male dancers who are on the shorter side still do partnering work? I think so, of course. Now, what you have to think about with partnering work is that obviously the female that you are dancing with, you don't want that female to be taller than you when she's standing on her point shoe because standing on a point shoe gives her a little bit more height. So I think the best thing to do is stand next to your female partner while she is on point and just measure to see that she's not any taller than yourself. This is not only to do with how, grip the, how you're holding the grips, but also someone who's taller than you will be a little bit heavier. And I'm not saying they would be heavy, I'm just saying for the longevity of the male dancer's body, you don't want anyone that's too heavy to partner. Now, so yes, you can still partner if you are on the shorter side. My recommendation would be to find a shorter girl and there's plenty of those to dance with. Let's continue. The next question is, what is your favorite ballet step? Now, this is quite a tricky one to answer because I love ballet as a whole, but I think my favorite ballet step for me is probably, I always love to jump, so I think if it is a part of ballet that I would say is my favorite part, it would be jumping. 
but if we're really going into my favorite ballet step, I would say it's a sison where you really get to split your legs all the way into that split position. And I think that comes from a young age. There's just something, I remember when I was about 12 or 13 years old and you know, the iPhone just came out and you could, you could take a video and then you could pause that video and you could see where you are in that split position. And there's just something about that since a very young age, I've just always liked doing a season um, and taking a, a, a sneaky picture of that jump itself. So that's my answer, a season is my favorite step. Now, I have another question from this person. And the question is, what's the hardest step you can think of? And I have to say, I've been thinking about how I would answer this question. And I'm not gonna say this is the hardest step I can think of, because there's plenty. I think what's the hardest thing to do is to do a lot of steps to your weaker side. I think that's always very, very tricky. I mean, if you just think, especially as a male dancer, doing a double tour, which you need to do many of in your dancing career, just doing one to the other side, there's just always something that doesn't feel quite right. Um, and I have that, you know, I used to have that with a lot of steps. So I think I would answer that question. My hardest step I can think of is pretty much all the steps to my weaker side. Let's continue with the next question. The question is, there are not so many very tall male dancers in the classical ballet world and in brackets above 190 centimeters. So that is pretty tall. Um, is ballet technique more difficult for tall male dancers? Okay, very interesting question. I think I'll, I'll talk to you about in two stages and I'll talk about when the, those dancers are fully grown. I think when those dancers are fully grown, no, I think ballet technique is as difficult for them as it is for a shorter person. Now, when those dancers are growing to that height, I think ballet technique can be more difficult to master. And I'll tell you why. When you're, obviously, when students, they have growth spurts, but obviously when you get really tall, you have many growth spurts to get to that height. So every time you have a growth spurt, what happens is you lose a lot of fast twitch fibers, which is your ability to move very fast. It's just something that happens in your muscles. So, and that's what happens when you grow, every time you grow. Now, when you grow to that height, you'll have more of those during your growing process. So I think if you're a shorter dancer, your muscles can keep up with the proportion of your bones growing alongside the muscles. Now, if you grow to that very tall height, it's just a slower process. And you often see young students that are very tall and very skinny, and what you can see there is that their bones are growing and their muscles are just not quite ready to keep up with that growth spurt and they look a bit dangly and they can't quite move very fast. So I think in the growing process, yes, it is dif more difficult for those dancers, but once they are fully grown up, it is as difficult for anyone else just as that dancer to you know, have a good ballet technique. Okay, next question. What are your ballet tips for getting better at training your weaker side? I'm very right side dominant and have a hard time jumping to the left and turning to the left. Oh my gosh, I can so relate to this question. I'm sure you've all heard about people either turning to the right or to the left, just as you have a stronger hand that you write with. And in ballet slang, we call that either you're a righty or you're a lefty. Now I'm a lefty. And I can relate to this question because in the majority of the corps de ballet numbers that I danced in, during my time with the Royal Ballet, I had to turn to the right, even though that's my weaker side. Now, these are dancers from the Royal Ballet who are very good at turning to the right. So me as a lefty, I had to make sure I could turn at least as good as I could to keep up with all those people who, are, who would prefer to turn to the right. So I can relate to this question very well. Now, in this particular instance, she's really asking about my tips to get her weaker side closer to her stronger side. So overall, I would say make sure that you train both sides, uh, sides equally. But to get your weaker side up to your stronger side, my recommendation would be to do everything twice to your weaker side and only once to your good side. And this way, your weaker side will get closer and at the same level as your stronger side. Next question. 
If there was one piece of advice that you would give to yourself when you were a teenager slash vocational ballet student, from your current perspective, what would this be? I can answer this very easily. And it would be to take a chill pill. And I, I see that in all my vocational students now. And I often give them an example. And I tell them, you're not in training to become a surgeon. If something goes wrong, no poor animal is going to pass away. Yes, in ballet, things go wrong and they have to go wrong. They have to go wrong from you to learn and get, and get better at the ballet technique because you learn from all your mistakes. And that's something that I really, I wish someone had told me because I put so much pressure onto myself. I mean, in the long run, it paid off because I did get in my career where I wanted to go and I got into the Royal Ballet Company. But my quality of life during those years was not great. I went to school, I had food, I went to bed, and I repeated that same process every year. So I just wish I just enjoyed that time of my life a little bit more. But at the same time, it did, it was fruitful and it did pay off. But I just, yeah, my advice would be just take a chill pill and just enjoy, enjoy the ride and don't be too hard on yourself. How did you find a transition from the Royal Ballet School Antwerp to the Royal Ballet School in London? Ooh, that's a difficult question because they are both great schools and I both, I'm in both schools I really enjoyed my time there. I think the big differences were, um, I'm sure you've all seen the, the movie Billy Elliot and when I watched that movie, I really as a young child I thought if I go to a vocational ballet school that's what it's going to be like. You're going to go in in the morning, dance all day and then you go home, no homework, no academics. You know, that's what I had in my mind. Now, when I joined the Royal Ballet School of Antwerp, it was very much that you had your normal academics. And if time permitted, it was allocated in the schedule. But on top of your academics, you had your dance classes. Now, the biggest difference there is at the Royal Ballet School, there was a lot more of dance and less academics. And somehow, from seeing Billy Elliot, I thought that was closer to the dream of training that I had. And so I really enjoyed that more rigorous schedule and more dancing hours during the day. Um, so I think that would be the biggest difference. However, I'm all for getting your academics in place as well. So I see, I see both schools having a very good advantage, but I would say that's the biggest difference between both schools. Right, let's go on to the next question. What did you find most rewarding when developing and growing as an artist? What can others do to develop their artistic skills? And again, this is a difficult question because ballet is such an artistic form of portraying a story. And I think, I think that's almost lacking in some of the educational um, settings that people train in. And what I mean with that is um, ballet, especially, especially for male dancers, it's all about how many turns you can do, what tricks you can do, and you know, and they're all fair points. You know, if you can do them, it's only going to be in your advantage. So I'm not saying don't do them, but what I'm saying is it would be great to have a class um, where you have to portray your emotions. and from the top of my head, I can't really think of a class like that being out there in other schools. So I think, you know, portray sadness, portray anger. I think that would be a great class. I mean, I've just, I just came up with a new class and now you are all going to steal my idea. So I don't know why I did this in this video. Um, however, yeah, training your artistic skills are very difficult. I think um, practice in the mirror, because the biggest thing with being artistic is it needs to be it needs to look real. So if you see someone on stage crying like that, it's not very realistic. So just try and, try and think of your natural reactions to emotions. And th those are the ones that you want to use. And that's where you're going to really develop your artistic skills if they are real and people believe what you are portraying. What's your favorite production and why? And this one for me is quite easy to answer. My favorite production and I think it's going to be my ultimate favorite production forever, is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And that was choreographed by Christopher Wielden. 
And I think the reason why it's my favorite production is because I was in the whole creating process, not just me, the whole of the Royal Ballet, but I was in the Royal Ballet during that time. And there's something so special about seeing a choreographer coming in and testing out some ideas and seeing the whole creation develop from start to opening night. And I think that was just a really exciting process from seeing the sceneries from the first time and seeing the costumes for the first time. And I'm sure if you've seen Alice in Wonderland, the makeup is crazy. So trying out the makeup for the first time. And, you know, the, the first run of those shows, I was very fortunate. Um, well, someone else was unfortunate um, to get injured, but I got the opportunity to jump in to dance a role that I was covering. And so I had a really good run of shows that first year of that production. So I think from the beginning to me being able to dance those roles in my first year in the company was amazing. And therefore, because I hold such good memories from it, that would be my favorite production. Now let's go on to the next question. Um, when and how did you discover your talent to teach, observe and analyze the movement? Now, I think from my previous video, you will have known that I started teaching um, figure skaters, actually. So not, not actually ballet dancers or ballet students. Um, so that's how I got into teaching. But very often in, during my time with the Royal Ballet, um, a dancer would come up to me and be like, oh, look, this step isn't quite working today. Um, can you just have a look? And there's, there's something about, because teaching for me, is, it's in two parts. It's telling someone what to do, or it's being able to fix something that is going wrong. And I think that second part is quite, that's a skill that you need to own to be able to be a good teacher. And I think that's what differentiates good teachers from just normal teachers. Um, so it just started by me picking up that people would appreciate my feedback. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I love mathematics and I think ballet is very, um, it's about mathematics. You need to know how the body works. You need to know how anat anatomy works um, and you need to be able to see what's going wrong. And I actually think I gained that from working with figure skaters because they turn in completely different positions and it's even harder to try and figure out what's going wrong. Um, and so, yes, that's how I would answer that question. But a very good question. Thank you for that one. What do you miss most from your time at the Royal Ballet, working as a professional dancer? And what do you miss the least? I think what I miss the most is just and this is probably an answer that no one else would give you, is the rigorous schedule. I, uh, I love, I love, I love being busy. I just absolutely love it. You know, we had from ballet class into rehearsals and then we had half an hour break and then we had another three hour rehearsal. But there's something about that, oh, come on, let's get through it. Like, I just love that, you know? So I think the schedule, it was so hard, but every night that I went to bed, I was like, yeah, I mean, I've really worked hard today. Um, and that's something I miss now because obviously now uh, teaching is hard as well, but obviously you need to be very busy to have that same time of schedule. Um, so I think that's what I miss the most. What do I miss the least? Probably when, um, when a cast for the next production comes out, the casting, um, you know, you may not always be happy or you may be really happy, but you may not be happy for your friend. Um, yeah, I think the, the whole atmosphere kind of changes. Some people are really happy and you're happy for those people and other people are a bit disappointed. And um, I'm, I was always that person that I always felt, I always felt bad for other people as well. You know, I always, you know, I'm quite a caring person. So I think like, I don't miss that part at all. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. Okay, next question. How do you improve the fastness of your head turning while doing turns. In Italian, we call it scatto di testa. And it is something I have been struggling with forever. Ha ha ha. Okay, well, at least I'm learning some Italian here. So apparently spotting in Italian is scatto di testa. So that's great. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to demonstrate this one. So you want to improve the fastness of your spotting action and my advice, and I give this to all my students, is to really count your spots in your head. So if you're going to do a double turn, you need to count one, two. And to improve the fastness or the speed of your spot is to make sure that those spots are very even. 
So I'll explain that with a triple turn. So let's say you are doing a triple turn. I'm talking about the spots only. What will happen, because you are taking momentum in your turn, what happens with momentum is that it slows down the more turns you do. So what normally happens in a triple turn is the spot is going at this speed. One, two, three. And that's a very natural thing. So what you have to fight against, you need to fight against that momentum. So my advice for you to, is to count your spots in your head, but also to keep them very even. One, two, three. And that's my advice to you. And I'll demonstrate that with a double turn. So I'm gonna go in parallel because I've got my microphone and I've got my phone. So bear with me. So this is what, no this is what normally happens when you're doing a double turn. So the first spot is quite fast and the second one is going to slow down. So fast, slow. Oh gosh, my hair is everywhere. I'm sure you could see my spotting, right? You know, you know me. Uh, sometimes it's not perfect, but you get what I'm trying to say. Now, now I'm going to do a fast one where I'm really thinking about keeping my spots really nice and even. Yes, so have a look. So one, two, and down. Yes, so there you could really see that my spots were even and actually I could maintain that momentum while I was turning. So to answer your question and how to improve your scatter di testa is to really count your spots in your head and make sure they are even the more turns you do. Next question. I was wondering if you have any tips for working with hyperextended legs. There seems to be different thoughts about whether heels should be together or not. I would love to know your thoughts and any advice you have for dancers with hyperextensions. Okay, so for those of you who do not know, hyperextensions is in the legs. It's when you are able to close your upper legs together without your heels touching. Um, now, I could demonstrate that by locking back. I don't I have a slight hyperextension, but some people suffer from that a little bit more. Um, so my thoughts on whether the heels should be together or not is, yes, they should be together. Where I have trained as a dancer, that was also um, applied. And the reason for the heels being together is because if you have hyperextended legs, students tend to really lock back into their knees. And if you think about the longevity of your joints, if you, if you do that for a 10, 20 year career, you won't have any good knees by the time you retire from your dancing career. So I, my advice is to keep your heels together just for the longevity of your joints and your body. However uncomfortable this is, because you might feel like you're always standing up with bent knees, but just think about your body. Your body is your tool, in, is your instrument as a dancer. So just take care of that instrument. Now, on that note, and don't, people don't often think about that, but this is one for male dancers. If you have hyperextended um, arms, I, I don't, so I can't really demonstrate, but I'm sure if I do that, you'll be able to understand what I'm trying to say. It's quite difficult when you're partnering, because if you imagine if you do a pressage and you fully lock your both arms, again, so imagine my hand is out here, it's very dangerous having a whole, a whole body's weight above your head all pushing onto your elbow joints. So just keep that in mind. So as a male dancer, if you have hyperextended elbows, make sure you keep your arms a little bit bent. It's so much heavier and it's so much harder, but just again, think about your instrument. Your body is your instrument and you want to take care of your body. So that's my answer to that question. And that was the last question. Um, thank you all so much for all your questions. Um, I hope you, you really enjoyed this video. There were some very good questions and I had to really think about my answers. Um, so that was really, really nice for me as well. And I feel like it's a good chance for us, for us all to get to know each other. Um, if you like this video, then give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you want to see more of me and my ballet tips. Now, if you have more questions, then just send them to me and I can film another question and answer video very, very soon. But bye for now and thank you for watching.